Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. So is the hard cry of somebody who is about dying at the point of death, or who has died, and is praying to God to preserve him, not to let him die or rot in the grave. Actually, this psalm is a vision that God showed to King David about the Lord Jesus Christ, 
when he was in the grave and he spoke his words to confirm what God had promised him. When you say preserve me, what does that mean? It means they keep me as I am. Don't let me decay. Don't let me rot. Don't let me fall. It's the word of preservation. Now, was keep me, Lord. Don't let my enemies kill me. Don't let them bury me. Why? It says, for in thee do I put my trust. Is that song? In thee, O Lord, have I put my trust. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. In thee, O Lord, I put my trust. This person is expressing faith in God that because you are my dependence, that is why I'm asking for you to preserve me. Because I know that only you can preserve me. Psalm 25, verse 20. It was a cry from the heart of somebody who is dying and asking God, Don't let me die. Don't leave me in this situation. Don't leave me in this pit. Because you are my trust. Psalm 25 verse 20. Psalm 25 verse 20. Yes. Keep my soul yes. and deliver me. Mm -hmm. Let me not be ashamed. Yes. For I put my trust in you. That is it. For I put my trust in you. The question is, where is your trust today? As a Christian, when you fall into trouble, when you are going through a crisis, in your marriage, in your job, in your finances. Who is your trust? You know that many Christians in the time of their affliction or crisis, they turn to the weak doctors. Why? Because their trust is not in God. Even though they come to church daily, they wear their sutanas, and they have the form of godliness. But when the crunch comes to the crunch, and they need again help, they need to go to one herbalist, one free doctor somewhere, because they don't trust God to deliver them. They say, oh, I can't wait on God. Suppose, God, suppose God doesn't deliver me, suppose God doesn't hear me. See, this situation with many, many Christians, this is the reason why actually God sent the pastor founder of this church. That was the reason he gave, when he said that he gave us a calling. And my people, many of them, when they go through trials of life, as they would, whether you're a Christian or not, you will go through a trial in life or trials. The point is, what do you do in that trial? So many of them, at this time, they run to the place of darkness for help. And they get the help, but Satan puts a mark on them, claiming them as his own, so that when they die, they will no longer see me. This is what God told the pastor founder of this church. So you might be having a Christian barrier for somebody who is never going to go to heaven because they have gone to seek the help of the force of darkness in the time of trial. And so this is why he sent him, so that he gave him the powers and the rays of prophets that people don't need. You don't need to run to any harvest when you're in trouble. You can always come to God. Say, so indeed, I put my trust. You claim you are a Christian, you claim you are this, you claim that, but where is your trust? Everybody can say they are Christians when everything is going well, there's money in the bank, there's houses, cars, everything. But how many can still claim to God when they've lost their jobs, they've lost their families, they've lost their finances, they've lost their careers? That's how you know those who truly trust God. Therefore, in thee 
do I put my trust? Because I trust you, God, that's why I can pray to you to preserve me because I believe in you. Don't let me die in this affliction. See? Say, oh my soul, you have said unto the Lord, you are my Lord, my goodness extends not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. In other words, as I'm seeking God's help, I remember that my goodness, my good acts, my charitable acts, they are not to bribe God. They are not to benefit God. They can only benefit the human beings like me. And as we do that, God will honor me. Some people think that they're doing God a favor by coming to church or by doing good acts to other people. No, 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 no. It's yourself you are doing good to, not other people. So he's saying that because he's trying to ask God to help him. He says, Do I remember God that my good acts did not bribe you, did not make any difference to you? It's only to others that I have, like myself. Those are the ones that can benefit, and by that, you can help me. Say, love your fellow human being as God loves you. Say, the sounds of the multiply those that hasten after another God. The drink offerings of blood were not offered. Let's stop right there. Say, the sorrows of the multiply those that worship or hasten after another God. When he says after another God, he's referring to anything outside Jesus Christ. Some people say, oh no, no, we're not Christians, we worship the same God. No, we do not worship the same God. Jesus Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the light. Nobody, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. You say, oh, we're worshiping God. But if you're not coming through Jesus, you are not worshiping the same God. And you cannot get to God outside Jesus. I know that's a big shock to many people who believe that, oh, their faith, they're going to go to heaven and all this uh, stuff. No. It says, no one comes to the Father except through me. So, those that worship another God, idolaters, idol worshippers, all these people, their souls will multiply. It. In other words, their lives will be full of affliction and problems. But they don't think that, they don't know that. They believe that they're getting away with it. They believe that they're the ones that are powerful, are the ones that are better off. No. Apart from this sorrow that we multiply, there is a bigger punishment waiting for them when they die. You know? And many of us, even though we are Christians, we still serve other gods. How? Because many Christians worship saints, like many Catholic saints. Many Christians worship their overseers, their geo, their founders. Many of them know more about the founder of their churches than Jesus Christ. That is idolatry. And those ones, the same thing would apply to them. Their souls were multiplied. There are many people who idolize their pastors. What they will do for their pastors, they will never do for their husbands and wives at home. That is idolatry, and they, the same thing, their sorrows have been multiplied. When I say sorrows, it means all kinds of affliction, sickness, trial. Why? Because only God can save you from those things. If you worship another God, you are not protected from those demonic attacks. How can you go against Satan when you are following Satan? No, he has a free, have free access to you. So that are two offers of blood will I not offer. Well, who are these people? Who are these uh, drinkers of blood? We see in so many places in Bible, Psalm 27, the same thing. In the demonic kingdom, blood is what they drink. That is their food. Marine kingdom is blood. Blood is their currency. Human blood. So when he says that drinkers of blood, he's talking of human blood here. So King David saw it, that they were good, even in his own time. There were people who are drinking the blood of human beings. And that blood is what they use to prolong their own lives, they give them all the things they're doing, what they're trying to do. See? So they drink of them, will I not offer? In other words, I will not be a part of them, nor take off their names into my lips. So there has to be a separation. You cannot be worshiping God and worshiping Satan at the same time. 
You cannot serve God and mama. You've got to choose one. Either you follow God, you forget about Satan, or you follow Satan and forget about God. But many of us are trying to do both. One leg in the church, one leg in the world. In the morning, we go for Sunday service, we shout, scream, dance. In the evening, we are at the house. Oh, please help me check this. I want to know what's going to happen to this. You are fully yourself because you cannot get help from God if you are doing like that. Because if God helps you, you begin to know that Babala will not to God that helped you. And many of us, we sacrifice our own lives by doing such acts. So idolatry is number one sin in the book of Contact Commandments. Uh, Exodus 25, Exodus 20, it says, Thou shalt not serve any other God apart from me. The first commandment. So, as I said, you don't have to worship an idol. If you serve anything in your heart, put anything in your heart more than Jesus Christ, that person is an idol to you and you're an idol later, even though you can be Christian. There are many people who keep statues, they bow down to statues. They have statues in their homes, all these religions. Uh, I once went to a shop. I went to a shop in Winnipeg here and uh, as I was going, I saw this man and he had a, a candle lit before his statue in his shop. And he was watching that statue and he just smiled. So it still goes on. So we must not follow any other person apart from Jesus Christ. Otherwise, our souls will multiply. The Lord is a portion of my inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintain my lots. Now it's claiming that, Lord, I belong to you and you belong to me. I have no other God apart from you. You are my inheritance. You maintain my lots. I'm holy for you. How many people can say that? If you go to the church today and say, how many of you can come out and say, the only person I worship is Jesus? You'll be shocked at the low number you're going to get because the majority of the church are involved in one form of idolatry or another. Of course, they won't tell you, but many of them belong to cults, belong to cover columns, you know, but they all white, wear sweater, and they come to church. So when he's saying this, he says, Lord, you know my heart, I have no other person but you. This is the way, it's only when you're in that situation that God can fight for you. If you are involved in worshiping another God, you cannot get God's help. Because if you got God's help, you will give praise to that. I don't know to God. Look at Daniel. God showed up for Daniel when he was on the lion's day because he had no other God but Jehovah God. He said, God saw the innocence of my heart and he has come to defend me. Had Daniel been worshiping another idol, the lion would have eaten him so quickly. But because he served God and God only, God had to save him. The same with the king of Hebrew when I went to the fire. Falling of fire. So the lions are falling unto me in pleasant places, yea, have a goodly heritage. Again, they are farming the inheritance he has. The fact that he, because he's with God, God is going to bless him. He has everything going well for him. He's saying all this to reassure, to let God know that God, I know with you, I'm okay. And my faith is in you. I know you're going to deliver me. Everything will be all right. As long as I am with you, as long as I can worship another God. So, those who worship another God, they are already doing themselves harm. Their sorrows will multiply. So, bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reigns on my heart instructs me in the night season. You know, God is called the oracle that lives in human bodies. What is an oracle? An oracle is something that speaks. That has a mind of its own. So, God speaks to us through our hearts, especially in the nights. He gives us visions, he whispers in our ears, you know, he directs us, he gives us songs in the nights. This is what God does. That's why he says, my heart instructs me in the night season because he is connected with God and God is his only source. Then God can truly minister to him. But we think that we can serve God and serve another God and we expect God to be telling us secrets. No. The Bible says God will share his secrets only with those who fear him, who truly belong to him. And I've said the Lord always before me, because I'm a right hand, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. 
Because I've sent the Lord before me, now was the Lord you have put you before me as my deliverer, as my hope. Then, and as my right hand, the right hand is the hand of power. I shall not be moved. So, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. This is a statement of faith, confidence in God. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those that come to Him must believe that He is, He exists, and the reward of those that He will be seeking. In verse 6. So, all these things is saying to reassure Himself that He did not need to fear, even though He's at the point of death, even though He's dying. He keeps on saying these things that, Lord, you are my hope, Lord, you are my deliverer. As long as I'm with you, I don't have to be afraid. I will not be moved. They will not kill me. My enemies will not kill me. Witches will not kill me. This is what you and I have to believe and speak out. But most of us are crying down in fear. We are so fearful of the witches, and of the wizards, wizards. No. If you truly know who you are in God, you will not be afraid of any power of darkness. In fact, if you know who you are, you will see that they will be running away from you. But most of us don't know that. I will believe all these stories and we all is a witch is going to kill me. What witch can cap over the child of God? Can darkness ever overcome light? No. Imagine this whole place being dark and just being one matchstick. Even if you like that one matchstick, it cuts away the darkness and you can see around you. Whereas before you couldn't see a thing. But one little matchstick will lighten the place. So don't think that witches can overcome you, the child of God. No. You only think that because you don't know who you are in God. See, therefore, my heart is glad, not because I shall not be moved, because I have, because it was at my right hand, even though I'm dying and at the point of death. So, therefore, my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. See, this is the crucifixion. He's saying that though I'm in the shadow of death, I'm in hellfire, but I know that God shall rescue me. See? So, my flesh shall rest in hope. Said, for you will not leave my soul in hell. You see? This is a testimony of our Jesus Christ when he was in hell. Remember when he died, he first went to hell. He spent three days and then he rose up again. So this is his testimony as he goes to King David. For you will not leave my soul in hell. Psalm 76, verse 4. Neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. Daniel 9, 24. Daniel 9, 24, Psalm 76, verse 4. So the statement of resurrection, I know, Lord, you will not leave me in hell. You will wake me up. I will not perish in this hell. Not only that, I will not see corruption. My body will not decay. Go on. Psalm, Daniel 9, 24, Psalm 76, verse 4. Psalm 76, verse 4. You are more you are more glorious and excellent than the mountain of prayer. Yes. The start of the, the oh, start of, okay, go to Psalm 49 15. Psalm 49 15, Acts 2 27. Psalm 49 15, Acts 2 27. Psalm 49 15. Yes. For God will redeem my soul my soul uh -huh. the power of the prayer. Mm -hmm. For he shall receive him. You see, he will receive redeem my soul from the power of the grave. The power of the grave is the power of death. And nobody has the power of death except God. So we have to say, I have the assurance that God would not live in the house of death. He conquered, Jesus conquered death when God raised him from the dead. Acts 2.27 and Daniel 9.24. Daniel 9.24. Yes. So for people and for your whole city. Yes. 
and to avoid the most holy. And the most holy, yes. So the most holy one was the Lord Jesus Christ, and he said that you will not allow me to see corruption. So nobody can go and say, this is the grave of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like the other people's graves, you can go there and find their bones. But nobody can point to the grave of Jesus and say, you know, this is where he, he was buried, his bones are here. No. Why? Because he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. Luke 135. And that's exactly that prophecy was fulfilled because in the book of Acts chapter 1, they saw him rise bodily into heaven. So, you know, they go to a place, the tomb, there's a place in Israel, everybody goes and they say that's where Jesus' body was laid, but you would never see any bones there. Yeah. Luke 1 35. Luke 1 35. Sorry. And the angel answered and said to her, Yes. The angels will come upon you, uh -huh. and the power of the eyes will overshadow you. Yes. Therefore, also, that the only one who, who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And says, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy One. Jesus is called the Holy One because he had no human father. The, the, the fetus, the, the womb, the, 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 the ovum was taken from heaven and put in Mary's womb. Mary was a surrogate mother. Jesus had no part. Our Mary had no part in the body of Jesus. The, the womb was implanted, the ovum was implanted in her womb, and she only carried it, supplied the uh, blood, the minerals for the baby to grow on to delivery. That's what happens to surrogate moms. The sperm is implanted to the ovum. Once it starts developing, they take that ovum and they put it in the womb of the mother. And immediately that ovum begins to implant and sends out arteries and vessels and connects to the arteries and begins to grow. So Mary was a surrogate mom of Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he's the Holy One. He had no human component in him. That will show me the path of life in the presence of fullness of joy at the right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So now he's celebrating. As I know, you will not allow me to see corruption. You will not leave my body, in, my soul in hell. He said, the two things. You will not leave my soul. When people go to hell, they don't go with their bodies. They go with their souls. The soul has its own body, heavenly body, which is different from a human body. He said, but thou will not suffer your holy one to see corruption. That's because this flesh. There are two things there. The soul, which goes to hell, and the body will decays. He said, no, no, what happened to me? My soul will not be allowed to be in hell. Why? Because you're going to resurrect me. And so, my body will not see decay. What a wonderful testimony of his faith in God. You know? So you and I have to, we need to have that faith in God that whatever we're going through, God is able to live us. He will not leave our soul in that pit. Like uh, Zechariah and Jeremiah was put in the waterless pit and he sank. You know, Joseph was put in the pit as well. This is the kind of psalm you should be praying with if you're in any trouble. And Lord, you will not leave my soul in hell. You will not allow me to see decay. You will not allow my enemies to kill me. They will not overcome me in this trial. You are showing that you trust God because you trust Him. He will preserve you. You know, when you preserve, meat. What did you put salt on it? And that salt prevents bacteria from coming to attack that chicken, whatever, and cause them to spoil. So Jesus said, I'm the salt of the earth. So I so said, you are going to preserve me. You will not let my body decay. I will not go bad. I will not deteriorate because I have faith in you. But you must believe that if you do that, you have no other God beside him. You can't say that if you're worshiping another god, that somewhere you're going to Babala or Habali somewhere. If that's the case, you cannot pray that prayer. It's only those that truly worship God that can make that claim and receive the deliverance that God promised. The next passage. Yeah. 
testimony of his deliverance. You can't know God is a healer if you have not been sick. You know, you can't know is a deliverance of giving me a peace where only God will take you out. You can't know that he is a God, a God of resurrection so you at the point of death and he delivers you. See? So the second letter that Paul wrote to his son of the Lord, Timothy, as a second passage of 4, 16 verses, the whole chapter of chapter 1. It says Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Timothy was the son, adopted son in the Lord. He was not a Jew, but Paul met him on one of his missionary journeys, and then he called him to be circumcised, and he followed him, and it was very useful to Paul. And you know, as usual, the apostle starts his letters by saying, Peace, grace, and mercy from God the Lord, Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you. I thank God for myself, for my forefathers, with pure conscience that without season I have the memories of you in my prayers night and day. See, night and day he prayed for his son, Timothy. How many sons do you have and do you pray for them? You see, without prayer, nothing will happen. Many of us, prayer has been minimized in the Christian world of today, replaced by all forms of programs, all forms of activities. Whereas the real engine that keeps the house warm is prayer. He said, I keep on praying for you night and day. That means night vigils. That means prayer during the day, every three, four hours, for God to establish his son. He said, why do we need to pray so much? Because that's the way God made it. Because when you pray, you communicate with God and you release God's power in your life. A prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. Nothing good can happen without prayers. And you know who the number one prayer warrior, prayer the intercessor, that Lord Jesus Christ. He that has given all the power in the world, he was the one that prayed most. That tells you something. If he can pray more than us, it means that he knows the value of prayer more than us. You know, he will pray all night, and in the morning you go out, and miracles begin to happen. Because he's already done the work. Don't think you can do anything without prayer. Those people who are doing fake miracles without prayer life, they're just they're using magic. Everything comes through prayer. Yes, it might be hard work, but it's worth it. The longer you can pray, the more power you have in changing circumstances. The reason why the world is such a mess is because the Christians have not on their duty of praying to God. God has the power to change anything, like even this Ukrainian war. God has the power to stop the war in a second. But how many people are ready to pay the price of prayer and fasting to him? Everybody is concerned about their own business is running out of skelter. He said, I thank God that every day, without ceasing, the Bible says, pray without ceasing. You must have a life of prayer. Every couple of hours, you go to church to pray. And you don't have to be kneeling down in church. You can pray on the plane, on the train, in the Uber, taking you to work, in the office. You can be talking to somebody and praying. Is your heart reason to pray. But you must maintain a life of prayer. That is your protection, that is the power. Without ceasing, I have remembrance of you in my prayers night and day. Greatly desire to see you. I'm mindful of your tears, that I may be, be filled with joy. So this boy, your son in law Timothy was filled with tears about his father and the Lord because at this time, Apostle Paul had been imprisoned for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I remember the faith that was in you, which dwelt forth in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and also as in you also. The book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 1. So this Timothy had a measure of faith in him, which the apostle recognized. But he also knew his ancestry. He knew his grandmother. 
You know, this immune is, is mother Eunice. And that faith had been transmitted down the generational line, the bloodline to Timothy. Acts 16, verse 5, Acts 16, verse 1. Why am I saying this? You need a good heritage. If you, verse 1, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. the son of a certain Jewish woman yes. who believed, but his father was a priest. Aha, you see? So, Apostle Paul knew that family. He knew his grandmother, he knew his father, and he could see that that faith had been given to him. So, I'm saying this because many of us don't realize the importance of our worshiping God. If you want your children to grow up as useful citizens, successful citizens in society, you better serve God. Because because of the certain God, God will give your children the same spirit, the same faith, and the blessing will continue on them. But if you choose to serve the devil or all these things, then your progenitors will be terrible. In fact, they did a study like that. They compared the children of two men that grew up in the same family. One of them was a bad alcoholic, and they followed the descendants. The other one was a pastor. So they followed the, for the next four generations. And the son, the children of the pastor became senators, doctors, lawyers, and their own children became the same. So they, they were continuously blessed. Whereas the children of the Holy Father, prostitutes, drug dealers, robbers, like that for four generations. So um, it's important if you want your children to make good in life, you better serve God. And God will honor your children, you promote them. So Said, so I put you in that you stir up the gift. He commanded Timothy to stir up the gift which was in him by the putting of his hands. So when the Apostle Paul laid his hands on Timothy, he imparted the gift. This is the ministry of laying of hands. You can release a gift to people by laying of hands. It was practiced in the Bible, and we should do more of it. Let's go to the book of um, 1 Timothy 4.14. So he asked him, said, I've laid my hands on you, I know you have this gift in you, this gift of evangelism. That's tied up, don't let it be dormant. There are many people today who have gifts and they're not using them. Many people have gifts of prophecy, they're staying at home, they don't come to church. Many people have gifts of evangelism, have gifts of preaching, they don't use it. For one time or another, Satan has discouraged them. And the gifts are lying them. And remember, on the day of judgment, you have to give account of that gifts. One, first Timothy 4:14. First Timothy 4:14. Yes. The only thing that gives us is in you. Yes. The mission is given to you by the prophecy with the lay, lay on the on the hands of the elder and fellowship. That's it. So this gift, you can be gifted by the partition of your hand, by laying of hands. But once you're given the gift, you must begin to use, you must begin to walk in that gift, practice it. If God has called you to be a preacher, begin to preach. If called you to be a prophet, begin to prophesy. If called you to be a musician, chorister, use it. So there's some that don't neglect the gift is in you. On the day of judgment, you shall be asked, what did you do with the talents you are given? You go back over the same machinery, talent, you have money, art, coin, all the while you're very low, worry, all so fishy and somewhat busy. Nobody, any, oh, how my way, you and I are going to stand before God and going to ask us the gift I gave you, what did you do with this person on the app? Many of you think, I don't have a gift. No, everybody in God's kingdom has a gift. Your gift might be waiting on other people. Your gift might be in sweeping the church. Your gift might be in encouraging. You know, your gift might be in giving to people. That might be the gift you can have. But every one of us has a gift. So don't say, I don't know my gift. Ask God, what is your gift? You have something you are doing that every time you do it, you have success in it. Know that that's your gift. That's your calling. You know, uh, you can just like I can be like you just go to talk to some people and you encourage them and lift up. Ah, I just talk to him and immediately you have a gift of encouragement. Begin to practice that gift. Begin to encourage people. You know that is your calling because where God leads you, you have success in it. It's God, not you. 
you know, as you use that gift, you find success, you have progress in helping people. So for God, and I told you to start the gift of God, which in him, which was on Timothy by the end of his hands. So for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of sound mind. You see, Timothy was being timid, afraid to preach the gospel. But Paul knew that he had the gift of evangelism in him. So he said, start the gift, begin to practice, don't be afraid. Your God is not a God of fear. The Bible says fear is a torment. For God has not given you and I the spirit of fear. No, a child of God cannot be fear. Why? Because God lives inside him. And the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. So if you are filled with God, you cannot have fear in your heart. Because God's love is in you and it will cast out every fear in you. Let's go to the book of Romans 8.15. And Luke 24, 49. Look, Romans 8, 15, Luke 24, 49. You and I need to remember that. Anytime you want to be afraid, remember that you are a child of God and God does not give you a spirit of fear. That of the devil. Is the devil trying to afflict you with that fear, not God? Yes. Oh, 49, 49. Okay, 49. Yeah. Romans 15. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But six. That is what is characteristic of a child of God. Power, sound mind, and love. Because God lives within you. Fear does not live within you. If you are having fear, Satan is the one who put it there. And you have to cast it away. Mm -hmm. Romans 8.15 Romans 8.15 Yes. For he did not receive the spirit of one of you. Aha. Uh -huh. To fear. See? For he received the spirit of one of you. By whom we cry out of the Lord. That's it. You have not received the spirit of bondage to fear. Fear is a snare, is a bondage. If you are fearful about this or that, know it's Satan. It's not of God. And begin to bind it and cast it out. But you have received the spirit of adoption, of sonship. So sonship is power. Mm. It's love. It's not fear. So this was the told Timothy, and you and I have to have the same spirit. We must not be walking in fear. You can say, oh, what do we? It's natural to be careful. It's not natural to be careful. How do you think? Uh, Daniel went in the lion's den, or the children of Hebrew went in the forest fire. They were not afraid. They told the king, like, look, even if you kill us, we believe that the Lord will rescue us. Mm. That is what a child of God should be doing. Not running helpless cows like a headless uh, robot, like a chicken, chocolate soldier. No. God is in you, lives within you, and you have power, sound mind, and love. Not fear. So if you are suffering from fear today, worrying about this, worrying about that, know it's Satan that has sent that attack against you. And you have to refuse it, reject it. How? By getting more of God in you, reading the word of God as you read it. As the person comes inside you, you will expel that fear. So therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord that is preaching the gospel, nor of me, his prisoner. You know, Paul had been imprisoned, and people naturally say, Oh, I don't want to see with the prisoner. He's in prison now. It's natural. Mm -hmm. Paul said, Don't be ashamed of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Be thou a partaker. Mm -hmm. That means, rather than you being ashamed of me or being afraid, go on as a soldier of Christ. As you preach the gospel, you will suffer afflictions. There's no way around it. The Bible says that anyone who will serve God must go for persecutions. Who will live a holy life must go for persecutions. So you must expect it. Don't think that, oh, you can just be doing the work or denying yourself of all these uh, sins and Satan will be watching you. No, no, he will attack you. He will attack you. That's part of your calling. So as you preach the gospel, you will be afflicted, Satan will send attacks against you, maybe in your job, maybe in your family. But this is why you have to be prayerful at all times. You know, uh, if you are 
if it is going well with you, it's because you have been praying. Things don't go well when there's no prayer. See? Because there are constantly attacks against you, against your family, against your walk. It's the prayers that will repel those attacks and give you victory. But if you think that you need to pray, no, then you will fall. They will suddenly get you. You know? So it said, God who has saved us. So don't be ashamed of the testimony of our God, or of me as prisoner, but be particular of the truth of the gospel of God, of our God, who has saved us and called us the holy calling. Not according to our own works, but according to our own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus. You and I are called and saved, not because we are so good, no. It's God's election. His election means it's God's choice. He can pick anybody he wants. You can say we are saved by faith. We are saved by faith in God, not of our works, lest any man should boast. But say God is now made a manifest to us by the parents of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had abolished death and given life and immortality to life through the gospel. So the gospel has the power to give us light. It's the power of immortality, that power to resurrect is in the gospel. What does the gospel mean? It's the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ, how we went to the cross and died in that place and how he was raised from the dead on the third day by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Apostle continues that, um, that you, he said he's an apostle to the Gentiles, yes, the Gentiles of anybody that was not a Jew, and then he, because of this, he has suffered a lot of things. And I all the apostles in the world have suffered most. They beat him three times, 49 lashes. One night he spent on the sea, you know, sometimes they, one, one time they throw stones at him that I might die, and the body I died, and they prayed for him and he rose up. So, out of all the people, Paul suffered the most. He so, said, But I know, so nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. I know whom I believed that is God, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. What is that thing you committed to God? His soul. God is able to keep you. If you entrust your soul to Him. Mm-hmm. That's why it says, Preserve me, O God, mm-hmm. in thee do I trust. Psalm 31, verse 5. 1 Peter 4 19. He's able to keep that which I've trusted Him, I've entrusted to Him until that day, the day of resurrection. Mm-hmm. He's able to keep me, He's able to preserve me. Psalm 31, verse 5. 1 Peter 4 19. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. You took it into the spirit. Yes. You have given me, O Lord. Yes. God of trust. Yes. You have redeemed me, God of all truth. First Peter 4 19. First Peter 4 19. Therefore, yes. let those who suffer yes. according to the will of God yes. commit their souls to Him uh-huh. in doing good mm-hmm. as to a faithful creator. That's it. Commit their souls to him. That's what he committed to God. He committed his spirit to God. And he said, I know whom I believed is God. He's able to keep me until that day. He said, Hold therefore fast the form of sound doctrine, sound words which you have from me, and in faith and love which in Christ Jesus. The good thing committed to you, keep by the faith. And it's all house and people are turned away from him, you know, because he had been imprisoned. But then he prayed for others of us, who often came to visit him in prison, he was not ashamed of his chains. But when he was wrong, he sought him out and found him. So the Lord granted to him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. That's a great prayer. Lord, let us find mercy Amen. in the day of judgment. Amen. That we are not cast away. Second Thessalonians 1 10. The great prayer, Lord, let me. Have your mercy. Grant me your mercy. Because when you grant your mercy, then you will not judge as you deserve. Mm-hmm. You know? So this honest process was very helpful to Paul. He helped him. He was not ashamed of him. Even though the others deserted him, like, uh, for like if I get us and heaven, you know, they deserted him. But he kept on going to visit him and helping him. So, second person is one ten. Second Thessalonians 1.10. Second Thessalonians 
So can you find it here? So it's telling us that may God grant us mercy in the day of judgment. And it says that um, when shall come to be glorified in the saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because the testimony among us will be the, in that day. See? Now, if you've been listening to me and you're yet to surrender your life to Christ, today is the day of salvation. Don't leave it any further. Know that you serve a God who is able to preserve you and keep you from death and even resurrect you as he did to our Lord Jesus Christ. So your soul is important. He said, I will not keep my soul in hell. You don't want your soul to go to hell. Hell is real. It's a place of torment. It's a place of fire that never stops burning. It opens. It's a place of snakes and worms that keep on eating the flesh of the occupants. Believe me, you don't want to be there. If that's the case, are you ready to serve God? Not because you want to go to hell, but because you truly love him. Then you can say this short prayer after me today. Lord Jesus, I've sinned against God and man. I'm sorry for my sins. Have mercy on me. Grant me your mercy today. Let me find your mercy to forgive me today. Wash my sins away with the precious blood. Come inside my heart. Rule and reign over my life. Now take my name from the book of the dead and put my name in the book of life. And I will serve you for the rest of my days. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That simple prayer. You said it and you meant it from the bottom of your heart. Jesus himself will come inside your heart and begin to grow in your life and will change you from inside out. You become a new creation. Your life will change. And he will walk with you until you get to your heavenly mansion. Let us pray, Jehovah. Jesus Christ, Holy Michael. Most merciful and blessing, Father, the God that preserved the Lord Jesus Christ, the God that not allow his soul to stay in hell. Father, don't let our soul stay in hell. Amen. The God that not allow him to see corruption. Don't let us see corruption. Amen. Let us see decay. Amen. Take us out of the pit of destruction. Amen. That's the world has put us in. Amen. Preserve us, O oh Lord, Amen. because we trust in you. Amen. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name I pray. Amen. 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 That's it. Until we meet again, please make sure you read the word of God, the food of your soul. It will guide and instruct you in the way of holiness. Pray without ceasing, as you had Apostle Paul pray, pray night and day for Timothy. You need to pray for yourself and your family, your church. As you do that, you'll see God move on your behalf. Read the word of God, pray and associate fellowship with other Christians. And the Lord will keep you and preserve you until the day. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless. It's a miracle. Go walking on. It's a miracle. walking on. It's the Alpha.